Psalm 100, make a what? Joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yes, very good. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Yep. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And then the last verse of that psalm is this one. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So that's a whole chapter of God's word. Five verses. It's short, but it's a hundredth psalm. And it just kind of like the 23rd Psalm. It's a good psalm to memorize. It's just very, very powerful. It's a great psalm of praise. So it would be a good one for you to memorize and just quote it back to God in your prayer time as, a, as an act of praise. Good, good stuff, powerful stuff. All right, let's do this last verse. For the Lord is good, for the Lord is good, for the Lord is good, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. We, we've talked about this, I think, but uh, mercy and grace are two of God's attributes. He's a God of mercy and a God of grace. And I've heard it said, and I think this is pretty close to the Greek and Hebrew, that it's a kind of a clever way of putting it. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. So we deserve because of our sin, death, and hell. But God doesn't give that to us because of his mercy. He doesn't punish us because he's merciful because of what Jesus did for us. But grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, like life, eternal life. Our sins are forgiven. We become his children. He gives us his peace and his joy and purpose in life. You know, it's, it's, it's all these spiritual blessings he gives us. And so these are things that we don't deserve. We have them by his grace. The things we do deserve, we don't have to do, have them because of his mercy. The things we don't deserve, we get to have because of his grace. So mercy is everlasting. He, he doesn't give us what we deserve. We deserve death, and ruin, and destruction, hell because of our sin. But he's merciful, and so he doesn't put that on us because Jesus took it. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. We talk about truth a lot back in Romans chapter 1. But the truth, God's truth is, is, is really important because people nowadays want to make up their own truth. And we can't do that. You don't get to make up your own reality. There's truth out there. There's spiritual truth. There's, there's truth in this world, material truth. There's truth about the creation. There's truth. And it endures to all generations. It doesn't end. God's truth is permanent. And they've got all these people out there trying to make up their own truth, and their truth is changing all the time, and it's silly, and it's nonsense, and they can't do it. The Lord is good, for the Lord is good, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, his mercy is everlasting, his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations, and his truth endures to all generations, and his truth endures to all generations. Another way of saying forever, just like everlasting. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures. Yeah, it means forever. You remember how he said it? Uh, it didn't. He didn't use everlasting this time. He used it the first time. His mercy is everlasting. His truth. Yeah, endures. Yeah, that's that's the idea. But he used a different way of saying it this time. To all, start with the G. No. I didn't focus on this word very much in there, but it was the last word in the verse. To all, you think about, think about parents, children, grandparents, grandchildren. Great great, great, there you go. Very good, good case. To all generations. Yep. All right. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endures to all generations. Very good. Okay. Anything you want to add before I pray? All right, Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this promise. Thank you that we know that you are good. You're always good. And Lord, sometimes when we question what's happening around us and we wonder why, we can still trust you. You're good. 
and you're going to work things out for our good eventually. And so, Lord, thank you that you bring us through the tough times and teach us valuable lessons about waiting on you and trusting you. You're good all the time. And thank you, Lord, that uh, your mercy is poured out on us because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you don't send us to hell. You don't destroy us. It's by your mercies that we're not consumed, you say in your word. So, Lord, thank you for your mercy and thank you for Jesus that allowed your mercy to be shown upon us. So thank you for your mercy and thank you that your mercy never ends. It's an everlasting. And thank you for your truth, Lord. We, we realize you are a God of truth. You're very serious about your truth. And you don't want us monkeying with your truth, Lord. You don't want us messing around and acting silly as if we could somehow make up our own truth or our own reality. Lord, we know that's nonsense. So I pray that we will simply agree with your truth, that we will understand your truth, that we will seek out your truth, and we'll stand firm in your truth and never question your truth. Because, Lord, your truth endures for all generations. It never ends. It never fails. And so we thank you, Lord, that you're a God of truth. And you've made it so important in your word. You've told us that your, your truth will set us free. And thank you, Lord, that you've told us that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, is the spirit of truth. And your word, your scriptures are, are the word of truth. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, said he was, he was the way and our truth and life and so thank you for being a god of truth and uh, we help us Lord, to recognize when the world around us disdains your truth and rejects your truth and tries to act like the truth doesn't isn't real so Lord, don't let us be deceived by that please and help us as we continue to look at some of the awesome things you've created thank you for the people at the discovery institute the uh, dis people of in de intelligent design who discovered these things and are showing them to the world. And Lord, I pray that more people will listen and realize that you are God and you're certainly the creator. And there's no other way to explain life without you. But thank you so much for this video they put together. We get to look at, and I pray you'd help us to learn as much as we can today from uh, your amazing creation, the truth about your creation. Thank you for the opportunity to live for you. I pray we'll live well for you today, that you'd help us to walk with you, to keep our focus on you, to learn from you, to get wisdom from you, to make good decisions. To bring you glory any way you choose in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I think we'll get through this video today, but I'm not 100. We were very enthusiastic about the possibilities uh, for explaining uh, the origin of the main life building elements. Despite his optimism, Kenyon faced a significant problem. To explain how life began, he first had to account for the origin of the essential building blocks of every cell that has existed on Earth, large complex molecules called proteins. Proteins have a wide range of function in the cell, everything from structural requirements in terms of scaffolding of the cell, the cytoskeleton, to enzymes where they're actually processing molecules to harvest energy or to build components of the cell. Proteins do pretty much all of the jobs inside of the cell, except for storing genetic information. That's left to the DNA, the RNA. But all the day-to-day -day jobs, cleaning up the cell, making energy, it's all proteins. Kenyon knew that proteins would have been as important to the first life as they are to living cells today. He also recognized the complexity of their construction. By the 1960s, scientists had determined that even simple cells are made of thousands of different types of proteins. And the function of these molecules derives from their highly complex three-dimensional shapes. The irregular shapes of some proteins allow them to catalyze or trigger chemical reactions because of the hand and glove fit that they have with other molecules in the cell. While other protein molecules form interlocking structural components. The individual parts of a bacterial motor, like this ring structure, are each made of either a single protein molecule or an assembly of proteins fitted together into a specific shape. These proteins are, in turn, made of smaller chemical units called amino acids that are linked together in long chains. There is a very great degree of intricacy of architecture down in the cell units in these protein-forming amino acids. In nature, 20 different types of amino acids are used to construct protein chains. 
Biologists have compared them to the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Alphabetic letters can be arranged in a huge number of possible combinations, and it's the sequential arrangement of the letters that determines whether you have meaningful words and sentences. If the letters are arranged correctly, you'll get meaningful text. But if they're not arranged correctly, you'll get gibberish. And the same principle applies for amino acids and proteins. There are at least 30,000 distinct types of proteins, each made of a different combination of the same 20 amino acids. They are arranged, like letters, to form chains, often hundreds of units long. If the amino acids are sequenced correctly, then the chain will fold into a functioning protein. Proteins are arranged with their amino acids in such a way that the amino acids collapse on each other into an architecture that is pre-programmed by the order of the amino acids. It folds into a certain structure, and that structure can do a certain function. So all proteins in the cell have a certain three-dimensional pattern that's based on the arrangement of amino acids in the chain. This arrangement is critical. For if the amino acids are incorrectly sequenced, a useless chain forms, and instead of folding into a protein, it will be destroyed in the cell. Proteins, like written languages or computer codes, have a high degree of specificity. The function of the whole depends upon the precise arrangement of the individual parts. But what produces the precise sequencing of amino acids that gives rise to the specific shapes and functions of proteins? During the 1950s and 60s, discoveries about protein structure forced biologists to confront this mystery. Dean Kenyon believed he could solve it. In his book, Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinman, proposed an intriguing theory. Kenyon wrote, Life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Kenyon proposed that the chemical properties of the amino acids caused them to be attracted to each other, forming the long chains that became the first proteins, the most important components in the living cell. And this meant that life was effectively inevitable, predestined by nothing more than chemistry. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument, Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. In living cells today, chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins. It is called DNA. Initially, Kenyon believed that proteins could have formed directly from amino acids without any DNA assembly instructions. And, and that's why so many scientists were excited about his theory. But the more he and others learned about the properties of amino acids and proteins, the more he began to doubt that proteins could self-assemble without DNA. In DNA, Kenyon encountered a molecule with a property he could not explain through natural processes or locked securely within its double helix structure, is a wealth of information in the form of precisely sequenced chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G. In a written language, information is communicated by a precise arrangement of letters. 
In the same way, the instructions necessary to assemble amino acids into proteins are conveyed by the sequences of chemicals arranged along the spine of the DNA. This chemical code has been called the language of life, and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Like other scientists working on the origin of life, Kenyon realized he had two choices. Either he had to explain where these genetic assembly instructions came from, or he had to explain how proteins could have arisen directly from amino acids without DNA in the primordial oceans. And in the end, he realized he could do neither. It's an enormous problem how you could get together in one tiny submicroscopic volume of the primitive ocean all of the uh, hundreds of different molecular components you would need in order for a self-replicating cycle to be established. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached, uh, I guess for me, the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon re-evaluated his theory, new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. The more I conducted my own studies, including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory, and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. The more I thought about the alternative that was being presented in the criticism, and the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address, the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding, uh, regarding origins. For Dean Kenyon, a new question became the focus of his search for life's origin. What was the source of the biological information in DNA? If one could get at the origin of the uh, messages, the encoded messages within the living machinery, then you would really be on to something far more intellectually satisfying than this chemical evolution theory. Yet Kenyon realized that he faced a narrowing set of options. By the 1970s, most researchers had rejected the idea that the information necessary to build the first cell originated by chance alone. To understand why, consider the difficulty of generating just two lines of Shakespeare's play Hamlet by dropping Scrabble letters onto a tabletop. Then considered that the specific genetic instructions required to build the proteins in even the simplest one-celled organism would fill hundreds of pages of printed text. Of course, a serious origin of life biologists did not believe that life had arisen by chance alone. Instead, they envisioned natural selection acting on random variations among chemicals to produce the first life. But there was a problem with this proposal. By definition, natural selection could not have functioned before the existence of the first living cell. For it can only act upon organisms capable of replicating themselves, cells equipped with DNA that pass on their genetic changes to future generations. Without DNA, there is no self-replication. But without self-replication, there is no natural selection. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization 
at all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. When I look at molecular machines or the incredibly complex process by which cells divide, I want to ask, is it possible that these things had an intelligence 
behind them, that there was a plan or a purpose to this structure. Science ought to be a search for the truth about the world. Now, we shouldn't prejudge what might be true. We shouldn't say, I don't like that explanation, so I'm going to put it to one side. Rather, when we come to a puzzle in nature, we ought to bring to that puzzle every possible cause that might explain it. One of the problems I have with evolutionary theory is it artificially rules out a kind of cause even before the evidence has a chance to speak. And the cause that's ruled out is intelligence. Since the late 19th century, since the time of Darwin, in fact, in part because of Darwin's writing in The Origin of Species, scientists came to con accept a convention, a definition of science that excluded the possibility of design as a scientific explanation. And that convention has a name, it's called methodological naturalism. And it just means that if you're going to be scientific, you must limit yourself to explanations that invoke only natural causes. You can't invoke intelligence as a cause. And yet, curiously, we make inferences to intelligence all the time. It's part of our ordinary reasoning to recognize the effects of intelligence. Consider, for example, these hieroglyphic messages carved upon the ruins of Egyptian monuments. No one would attribute the shapes and arrangements of these symbols to natural causes, like sandstorms or erosion. Instead, we recognize them as the work of ancient scribes, intelligent human agents. Similar reasoning leads us to conclude that the mysterious stone figures on the shores of Easter Island were not formed by the actions of wind and water over great periods of time. Nor do we presume that plants could grow into these familiar shapes without some manner of intelligent guidance. Of course, we make these inferences all the time, and we know they're correct. But the question is, on what basis do we make these inferences? What are the features that enable us to recognize intelligence? Recently, in a book titled The Design Inference, mathematician William Dembski has made an important breakthrough in understanding design reasoning. Dembski has identified the specific features of artifacts that cause us to recognize prior intelligent activity. I came to this by trying to look at how do we reason about design? What, what are the logical moves that we have to go through in order to come to a conclusion of design? So what I'm trying to do is to establish reliable, empirical, scientifically rigorous criteria for deciding whether something is in fact designed. So I was looking at the logic of it. And what I found was you need improbability and you need specification, the right sort of pattern, these objective patterns. According to Dembski, human beings correctly detect the activity of intelligence whenever they observe a highly improbable object or event that also matches a recognizable pattern. Just such a pattern is found in the Black Hills of South Dakota. If you travel through the West, you'll see lots of different shapes on mountainsides, most of which mean nothing at all. They're just rocks strewn in various patterns. But what you don't see are the faces of Lincoln, Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and George Washington on mountainsides. The only place you see that is in South Dakota. And the reason it's there is because a sculptor, an eccentric sculptor, decided that he wanted to honor these presidents by spending the larger part of his life chiseling their faces in the side of that mountain. That pattern is improbable. A random hillside is also improbable, but a random hillside doesn't specify anything. We do know, though, that there were four guys who were presidents of the United States who had particular patterns with their faces, and those patterns on the mountainside in South Dakota match faces elsewhere. If I look up and see the faces, I immediately recognize that they match the faces of the four presidents that are known from money or portraits at the National Gallery or paintings and books. And, and so I realized when I look at Mount Rushmore, we have not only a highly improbable configuration of rock, but one which matches an independently given pattern that reliably indicates intelligence. So we have a small probability, specification, its design. On a seashore, another improbable pattern etched into the earth illustrates how we detect design. No one would infer that this message was written by the movement of the tides. Instead, because of the characteristics of this pattern, we identify the words as the products of intelligence. 
that improbable arrangement also conforms to an independently given pattern, namely the shapes of the letters that we recognize from English alphabet and the words that we know from English vocabulary. And so it's the improbability of the arrangement plus the fact that it conforms to an independently given pattern that triggers the awareness of design. This illustration suggests that William Dembski's criteria for design detection, small probability and specification, are essentially equivalent to information. The type of information present not only in pictures, written texts, and numeric sequences, but also encoded in software and radio signals. The ability to detect information in electromagnetic transmissions has made possible a unique search for intelligence. For more than three decades, astronomers involved in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, have monitored radio signals from outer space in an attempt to find information-rich patterns. Typically, radio telescopes receive either random noise or simple repetitive signals produced naturally by stars, galaxies, and other celestial objects. But astronomers recognized that if they ever identified an information-bearing signal, it would confirm the existence of intelligent life beyond the Earth. Some have speculated that an extraterrestrial civilization might have attempted to communicate by transmitting messages in the universal language of mathematics, perhaps through a recognizable pattern like a series of prime numbers. You're not going to get that by chance. So you need complexity or improbability, lots of prime numbers, and you also need a uh, pattern. And it has to be the right sort of pattern. It's not a pattern that you're imposing. It's a pattern that's, that's there objectively. To date, SETI research has failed to detect any pattern or information that would indicate intelligence in a distant galaxy. But in another universe, much closer to home, scientists have discovered a wealth of information within the nucleus of the living cell. DNA has a structure that is ideal for carrying information in the A's, T's, C's, and G's, the bases of the double helix of DNA, is the potential for storing a tremendous amount of information. There is, in fact, no entity in the known universe that stores and processes more information more efficiently than the DNA molecule. A full complement of human DNA has three billion individual characters. Analysis of the DNA molecule's coding regions show that its chemical characters have a specific arrangement that allows them to convey detailed instructions or information, much like letters in a meaningful sentence or binary digits in a computer code. Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a computer program, only much more complex than any we've been able to devise. And if you reflect on that even for a minute, it's a highly suggestive observation because we know that Bill Gates does not employ wind and erosion or random number generators to generate his software. Instead, he employs intelligent engineers, software engineers. And so everything we know in our experience suggests that information-rich systems arise from intelligent design. But what do we make of the fact that there is information in life, in every living cell of every living organism? That's the fundamental mystery. Where does that information come from? And the nucleotide base For the past 15 years, philosopher and scientist Stephen Meyer has worked to answer this question. Meyer has developed an argument to demonstrate that intelligent design provides the best explanation for the origin of information necessary to build the first living cell. The information that the DNA molecule holds. It's part of our knowledge base that intelligent agents can produce information-rich systems. So the argument is not based on what we don't know, but it's based on what we do know about the cause and effect structure of the world. We know at present there is no naturalistic explanation, no natural cause that produces information. Not natural selection, not self-organizational processes, not pure chance. But we do know of a cause which is capable of producing information, and that is intelligence. So when people infer design from the presence of information in DNA, they're effectively making what's called in the historical sciences an inference to the best explanation. So when we find an information-rich system in the cell, in the DNA molecule specifically, 
we can infer that an intelligence played a role in the origin of that system, even if we weren't there to observe the system coming into existence. Meyer's work on the origin of genetic information is now part of a comprehensive scientific case for design that grew out of a meeting of scientists and philosophers on the central coast of California in 1993. Their objective was to reassess an idea that had dominated biology for more than a century. In the process, they gave birth to a theory that has become known as intelligent design. To me, the great promise of design is it gives us a new tool and explanation that belongs in the toolkit of science. Intelligent causes are real, they leave evidence of their existence, and a healthy science is a science that seeks the truth and lets the evidence speak for itself. The argument for intelligent design is based on observation of the facts. Now that's my definition of good science. It's observation of the facts. Now when you observe the facts, as Michael Behe has done, what do you observe? You observe this incredible pattern of interrelated complexity. And the way we conclude intelligent design for the bacterial flagellum is the same way we conclude intelligent design for an outboard motor. When we see an outboard motor, we see the way the parts interact and, and so on. We know somebody made that. Uh, the reasoning is the same for biological uh, machines. So the idea of intelligent design is a completely scientific one. Certainly it, it might have religious implications, but it does not depend on religious premises. When I look at the evidence objectively, Without ruling out the possibility of design, design just leaps up as the most likely explanation. And that's why I believe that it's true. I think design is back on the table. You know, we can't explain these systems by natural law. And if we're searching for truth, and they are in fact designed, if we have to be design engineers to understand them, then I say, what's the problem? You know, you go where the data leads you. And the implications, yeah, they have profound metaphysical impl implications, but so be it. So it's a powerful idea that the universe is rational and comprehensible, underwritten by a supreme intelligence that meant for this world to be understood is something that underwrites then the program of science because then you can go out and look at the world and the world will make sense. If it's all just a chaotic assemblage, there's no reason to expect any rationality out there. But if it in fact is the product of a mind, then you can go out and science becomes this enormous, wonderful puzzle solving project in which you can expect to find rationality and beauty and comprehensibility right at the foundation of things. 150 years ago, Charles Darwin transformed science with his theory of natural selection. Today, that theory faces a formidable challenge. Intelligent design has sparked both discovery and intense debate over the origin of life on Earth. And for a growing number of scientists, it represents a paradigm, an idea with the power to, once again, redefine the foundations of scientific thought. During the 19th century, scientists believed that there were two fundamental entities, matter, and energy. But as we enter the 21st century, there's a third fundamental entity that science has had to recognize, and that is information. And so as we encounter the biology of the information age, the suspicion is growing that what we're seeing in the DNA molecule is actually an artifact of mind, an artifact of intelligence, something that can only be explained by intelligent design.
Well, I've watched that video now many, many times. Every time I watch it, I get blown away again. And one of my great concerns is that, uh, you know, they use a lot of words that you may not be familiar with, and I'm, and I'm concerned that you won't get the the depth and the power of it, but it is an awesome video. And uh, as you go on further, you might want to watch it, find it and watch it again, unlocking the mystery of life, but it just clearly points to a creator very powerfully. So is there anything else you want to say before I stop? Today? I do. Thomas Priest is supposed to pray today. He hasn't prayed before. I, I, have you seen him yet? There are three of them. He's the eighth grader. There are two seventh grade Thomases, and he's an eighth grader. All the Thomases are kind of little little guys. But I, anyway, uh, he. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find him in a while, but thanks for asking. Okay, anything else? All right, Father, thank you so much for raising up these scientists, some of whom I know really love you and your word. And, uh, and Lord, thank you for helping them look at your creation and see your handiwork and realize that you are a great designer. You're intelligent and you design things. In fact, you're super intelligent, Lord. Your intelligence is beyond our ability to comprehend. But you're the one that created all this, including us. And we don't ever want to forget that, Lord. So when somebody tries to deceive us, somebody foolish who wants to somehow pretend that they can somehow imagine that uh, things got here through the process of undirected evolution without you being involved, Lord, help us never to be deceived by that stuff. Just because there are a lot of so-called scientists who claim to believe it. I know that one of these days they're going to be exposed and we'll all see the truth. But Lord, right now, there's a lot of confused people in this world. So please don't let us be confused like they are. But help us to realize that you are God and you've created some awesome, awesome things. So thank you for giving us a little glimpse of it. Now, I pray the rest of this day you'll help us to walk with you and bring you glory and honor and praise. And, uh, and uh, be the kind of people, the kids you want us to be. And be a blessing to others. Be good listeners and encouragers. And not be self-centered and selfish and egotistical or proud or lazy or any of that stuff. Lord, help us to be uh, just what you want us to be. Help us to be more like Jesus. Put this day in ourselves in your hands. And ask you to get glory in Jesus' name. Amen.